Welcome to Here She Stands, the podcast where Lutheran women from across Australia come together as a community, sharing stories and testifying to God's goodness. We do this so when the tribulations of this world try to push us down, we can hold firm to the word of God and confidently say, here I stand, I can do no other. My name is Lexi and I'm the wife of a pastoral student and a homeschooling mama. And I'm Sonia, a Lutheran pastor's wife, homeschooling mum and homemaker. In today's episode, we're talking with Elizabeth Draco from South Australia. If you listened to our episode on the 2024 Young Adults Retreat, you would have heard Elizabeth's brief interview with us. Today, she's back to share more of her story. Hello, Lizzie. Hello, Sonia. Hello, Lexi. It's lovely to have you here. It's and yes, so nice. we are joined by Lexi. Hello. Hello. Welcome, Lizzie. Thank you. So where do you live, Lizzie? So we're in the Riverland in Bury. Um, actually, I'm two houses down from the house I grew up in, which is really cool. Yeah, that's uh, not very common these days with everyone traveling around so much. No. Uh, who is in your family, your immediate family? So I live here with my husband, Hayden, and then there's my oldest daughter is nearly six. Or she'll tell you five and three quarters. <laughs> um, and then my second is my son. He is nearly four. And then there's also the youngest. So I've got to stop calling a baby who is nearly two. Aww. And he's also a son. <laughs> so how did you and Hayden meet? So we got married at the start of 2017. That is seven years, isn't it? <laughs> we, it was a bit of a weird sort of lead up to meeting and we were both involved with Christian Life Week camps. Um, I think he might have started directing his camp from his area a little earlier than I started directing mine and his camp joined our camp one year and I wasn't there and then they liked us so much they kept coming back and so I met him at a leaders retreat before camp when we were put in the same group to discuss the studies. So yes, that was the start of everything. <laughs> and what do you do? So I am at home, which I love. I've been really lucky to not have had to work since I was pregnant with my oldest daughter when I had just a really flexible job working at ALC for a little while. Okay. What were you doing there? Uh, I was working in the refec and in the um, some of the old boarding rooms that were being used kind of as an Airbnb. I heard that you've started homeschooling recently. Yeah, this was yeah. our third week, I reckon. I think I expected it to be a harder adjustment than mm. it has been, but it's been very simple and overall quite pleasant. That's really good. And um, I saw on your Facebook page that you were doing Aesop in the Sandpit or something. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> reading, I think it's two of Aesop's fables each week and just trying to sort of keep the two youngest boys entertained and not try and put them off oh just wait a minute just wait a minute so we try and do stuff outside as much as we can and that's one of the wonderful things about homeschooling is you can accommodate little things like that like yeah. wiggly boys so lizzie were you raised lutheran yes yes yeah, so both my parents are lutheran and were both raised lutheran as well <laughs> so yeah a whole long lot of lutherans there. yeah really lucky to have some good historians in our family as well so i've got Quite a lot of the history, especially on my mum's dad's side, we can sort of trace right back to, oh, let me see if I can get the name uh, right, Friedrich Wilhelm Kleeman, who came over from Hamburg what in, oh, no, I can't remember what year, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, very long line there. I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, and that's actually something that's worth being proud of, you know, having that faith in the family so far back. <laughs> yeah. And what was your spiritual upbringing like? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, people say cradle Lutheran. That's probably a pretty good description. <laughs> yeah. We've always been to church and I was really lucky that my parents could send me to a really good Christian school. Yeah. And then there's also been the example of my parents. My dad was often really involved in a lot of sort of ecumenical youth groups and youth ministry and that sort of thing. So that was always around me. And mum was quite involved with the school. And yeah, they've always been involved with the church. And I've had a really awesome youth group to go to when I was kind of in high school. And lots of good 
friends and yeah really have had it so good <laughs> so blessed in that regard yeah so even when things were kind of I didn't find high school amazing I didn't love it but I always had like a really strong lovely youth group yeah so that was where I belonged I suppose and so that sense of belonging was really important yeah. um yeah just sort of have been surrounded by faithful people my whole life which is really wonderful Yes. Now, when you did your very brief interview with me at the Young Adults Retreat, you did briefly mention that there was a point in your journey where you started to dig deeper into your faith and into, yeah, your Lutheran heritage. So how did that all come about? Yeah, I think it possibly maybe even goes back to maybe year 12 when I did Metamorphosis, which is a certificate three in Christian ministry and theology. And that's a non-denominational thing run by, oh, I have forgotten. I don't remember. But I remember sort of noticing that the questions that you'd have in your workbooks and the things you would discuss were really good, but there was kind of never quite a definite answer to them. It was really very, you should think about this, this is important. But then also, depending on which school you were with, which peer group, you were, so you were in a peer group with the people in your area, that really depended on how you answered questions and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that might have been probably the start of just thinking about that and realising that maybe I didn't know as much as I wanted to know. Yes. And then I did the country thing and moved to Adelaide in 2015 and I was going to a Lutheran church then. I had a friend who was in a non-denominational church and every so often he'd say something and I'd be like, whoa, hang on, that, that seems, that feels really crazy. I feel like you've got something really wrong there, but I, I don't know why. I couldn't tell you what seems wrong about that and I can't ah. give you an argument. So maybe it's not wrong. Mm -hmm. And that kind of happened a few times. And that was a really interesting time and it was not long after that that I met Hayden and it sounds funny but I think I appreciated that he would argue with me about things mm. um so if I'd say something he'd be like no because of this and at first I was like whoa hang on what and it was quite an uncomfortable time for a while but I really appreciated someone who would take this stuff seriously and I think one of the major turning points was he'd asked me to read Jonathan Fisk's book broken and that was really amazing and really difficult and I distinctly remember thinking I want to throw this book under the bus that I am on right now this is so uncomfortable it's, I hate this I know it's really good but I hate it <laughs> because I could see over and over oh all these these little things that I kind of didn't realize that maybe I hadn't directly been taught but kind of had gleaned from I don't know, the atmospheres of things or just off of fan comments that I went, oh, actually, that's not biblical. Whether or not I feel God is irrelevant because he's there. Yeah. And that was a whole lot of other things as well. And that book right at the end has just the most spectacular, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the heaviest law and then the most amazing sweet gospel and I remember I was sitting in a car coming back I think from the Adelaide Hills after another Christian Life Week leaders retreat and I was reading this law bit and I was just despairing and I messaged Hayden and I was like what are you getting me to read this is awful everything is terrible everything is doomed oh my goodness and he goes just keep reading I was like oh, okay all right and yeah then just after the full heaviness of the law which I I think I, I mean, I probably heard it, but never, it never sunk in that much. I think that actually I am totally, completely helpless and sinful. And then moving from that to the gospel to realize that this has nothing to do with me. This is everything God has done was really just mind blowing. And I think from there, I really came to enjoy theology. And at the time, Hayden had, I think he wasn't living in Adelaide. He was living in Clare, but he had just finished boarding at ALC. And so most of his good friends were pastoral students or, you know, around pastoral students all the time. So I had no end of pastoral students to talk to about things and just overhear conversations with. So that, that was a really wonderful time of just thinking, 
ah, oh, all this stuff that's been available to me my whole life. And people have probably tried to teach me. It's probably not that, you know, no one's taught me this, what's going on, but I just haven't understood it. Or maybe I've just sort of written it off. And then there is probably also an element that I think there's not quite as much teaching in the church as there could be. And we sort of, I think, water it down for fear of scaring young people away with heavy stuff. Mm. So I'd done step up to communion. I'd done confirmation. But there was so much that I was going, wow, this is this is amazing. We have doctrines about this. We have a doctrine of vocation. Now I know what the difference between justification and sanctification are and all sorts of things like that. So that was, yeah, really just a big time. <laughs> yes. And would you recommend that book now? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we'll link it down oh, in yeah. the show notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really well set out and it's very, despite being big topics it's written very easy to read Hmm. it's got a very engaging style that's not difficult and um just going back to what you said about you know some places not wanting to bring the deep heavy theology into things because it scares young people away like it's just crazy because that's Mm -hmm. what brought tasman and i into the church was the beautiful theology and the fact that it is so deep so that it encases every aspect Mm. of your life like the doctrine of vocation wow that changed the way that I saw motherhood and yeah we need the deep theology the young Mm. people need the deep theology yeah because life has hard questions oh yeah we need to be able to answer the hard (laughs) questions yep and Lutheran theology really does do that that's what I love about it as well Mm. yes I wonder if um, perhaps one of the downsides of a long Lutheran heritage is we're so used to all this amazing yeah. stuff that we have that is just there all the time and we don't look at it. Like, oh, we yeah. can go read it any time. Yeah. And it's just every day so we don't look at it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember when, um, yeah, when Taz and I first started going to the Lutheran church, um, I said to the pastor at the time, this is amazing. The hymns are amazing and there's just so much richness in being Lutheran and in this theology and in the, you know, the Book of Concord. It, it's just amazing. Why are we not so excited about it? <laughs> yeah, yeah Lee and I have had similar conversations. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's, yeah, you're definitely really blessed to have grown up in that and mm-hmm. now, yeah, really realising how amazing it is and uh yeah. A lot of Lutherans do kind of seem to miss out on that a little bit. Mm. So Hayden studied at ALC for a little bit, didn't he? Yeah. Or for a couple of years, yeah. Is oh, the first one, Bachelor of Theology, I think. think Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was really wonderful. I think it was about four and a half years we were there for in the end. And it was, there was certainly lots difficult about the time when we, we had our first two kids there and that's intense, <laughs> <laughs> but I am so grateful to have been there for that and have had that real sort of village. Yes. I don't talk about you need a village, but that is such a, a village style community. And it's the second time I've been able to be in that sort of community. And it was just, yes. just amazing. So mm-hmm. wonderful. Being able to go to chapel every morning and I, I went along to, oh, what was it, early church history with Dr. Tom Pete, which was incredible. That was wonderful. And it was just such a good place to be newly married and having kids. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And just like you said, just having people around constantly that are talking about theology and mm. discussing it and passion about it and, yeah, just being surrounded by that all the yeah. time. So good. We should have that all the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, sometimes I'd be sitting in bed at 11 o'clock. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And I could just hear these deep theological discussion. Oh. <laughs> it happens so often. I'd, oh, I'd just man. sit there rolling my eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This Especially is my life. Now. Comments, you can hear everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it's it was it's such a blessing, honestly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it sounds amazing. To be honest, I'm actually quite jealous yeah, because oh, yes. cause a lot of the like all the studies online now, so they don't have the on-campus village yeah. life anymore. 
Yeah, but I've heard so many pastors and so many pastors' wives just talk about the community and the village mm-hmm. and how it played such an important part in preparing them to go into ministry mm-hmm. as yeah. pastor and pastor's wife. Yeah. Mm, at the start of our time there, I think it must have been, oh, gosh, am I going to get the wrong book here? I think I read, I've read, uh, I no, I think it was a Bonhoeffer. I can't think what book, though. And I think it was that book that was talking about how grateful we should be for for Christian community because so many people don't have that. And I've never really thought about that. And, yeah, that really, I think, shaped how I viewed that time as well. Yeah, I think we really do need to cherish Christian community because I read stories of persecuted Christians overseas who are in jail. And in some situations they don't have access to a Bible for years. They don't Mm. have access to other Christian brothers and sisters. Christian community is so important and it's it's a privilege that not all Christians get. Yeah. So Lizzie, the deepening of your faith seemed to be also influenced by Hayden, who is now your husband, and he seemed to play mm. quite a big part in just helping you and encouraging you to to look into your faith, especially the Lutheran expression of your faith. So in what ways in he gave you that book to read. Mm. Were there any other ways where he really helped you to expand your knowledge of your faith? Yeah, I think perhaps even just the fact that he was so interested in theology, I think particularly from having boarded at AOC, it was just something he was interested in. That was like one of his interests, part of his personality. And so that we talked about it a lot. And it just was just an everyday part of his life and yeah so he had been boarding at ALC and that was something he'd been thinking about a lot and I think he also had a perhaps a similar experience being sort of reintroduced or introduced deeper into Lutheran theology just by being around the pastoral students and I think particularly by a bible study that had been run there for the boarders and so I think it naturally just was something that we're both interested in. And I think it's part of what drew me to him. I wouldn't quite say love at first sight, but I remember at the director's retreat where we met and we'd been doing this preparation on the Bible studies for camp together. And I remember thinking, oh, seriously, God, like not right now. I feel like I could probably potentially marry him one day, but I just don't want to deal with that right now. (laughs) Can we not? But it was also such a relief because I remember thinking that I just... I desperately wanted to meet someone who was interested in theology and who it wasn't, you know, just a side thing. And yeah, to see that we had the same standard, that anything we came up against, we knew we were going to the same place to sort it out and find the answer. So yeah, it was just very comforting. I think it was very comfortable straight away. And I think we just had more conversations Probably not as much as we would have liked when he started studying just because it was quite a busy time. Yeah. But again, just being around the sim and hanging around with the the people there, it just comes up a lot. It's just what you start talking about. What happened at class today? Oh, we talked about this. And then you're talking about substitutionary atonement or you're talking about, oh, who was it? Athanasius picking pears when he shouldn't have and you know, all sorts of crazy things. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. By the time you got married, did you find you were pretty much on the same page with everything or were there things that you still sort of had differing opinions or understandings on? I'd say we were probably fairly much on the same page about things by then. Yeah, it was more that he would know stuff from studying that I just hadn't learned about yet. And I was always quite comfortable to ask, okay, but why is this the conclusion from that? And if we didn't know, we could go ask someone else, you know, next yes. door probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is such a great blessing to have a mm. husband who is interested in theology and has a love for God and love for the Bible. Absolutely. Um, it's such a huge blessing. Yeah, because they're often very active in leading their family in scripture and mm. in learning about God as well. And Tasman is like that, and he is such a um, he has such a pastoral heart for me and mm. our children. And he's not a pastor yet, but he is he, in many ways he he pastors our family and leads us spiritually. Mm. And I imagine mm. that Hayden is the same as well. Yeah, it definitely took us a while to sort of find our groove a bit and realize that 
we had to be a little bit more intentional about making sure that we had learning and Bible study in our home because it's very easy to just write off what was going on around us at ALC. And then when we moved away, it was just all gone. Mm -hmm. So there's no morning chapel. And I suppose even when we were there and there was COVID and there was no morning chapel and not so much fellowship, we sort of started realizing, okay, a lot of this we've relied on the things around us and they've been wonderful, but we don't have that anymore. Mm -hmm. And we still don't have it perfect by any means. We have the small catechism for kids, I think, is the book by the table. And we try and read that at tea and don't always remember. And I'm trying to remember to read the Reader's Book of Concord, which has sort of taken a little bit of a backseat in the last few weeks with homeschooling. But yeah, we're just we so lucky to have so many resources around us that they're always there to pick up whenever we think about them. Yeah. But I think one of the great blessings of homeschooling then has been that that is included in our homeschooling. So there's an Old Testament and a New Testament reading every day. Yes. And so that's it has an extra level of priority. This is now part of our schoolwork and this doesn't get missed because this is scheduled into yeah. our day. Yes. And not just hopefully remember at tea time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we're trying to work a little bit more in there. Another thing that we really like as part of our homeschool schedule is we have a hymn. I think it's a different one every month. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we pull from what other people have suggested, which are kind of perhaps more ecumenical ones that everyone knows. But occasionally we'll say, ah, I think we can do a little bit better than that one. So we've got the church as one foundation this month. And even though the kids aren't going to remember it, it's five verses. They are hearing it they'll recognize it at church and I think hey we know this song this is exciting yeah and it just gets stuck in my head too which is really handy for me <laughs> Alexi you mentioned before just the pastoral heart that your husband has for your family and I find the same in Lee and just yeah how he oversees kind of um, the family in a spiritual sort of way and Sometimes I do really have to swallow my pride <laughs> and accept that if there's reconciliation stuff, like, you know, if he says, you know, do you forgive your child? <laughs> Obviously, insert child's name and child, do you yeah. forgive your mom kind of thing. Afterwards, I'm so thankful for the spiritual leadership and it just is the best way to reconcile to each other. Do you find that you have struggles sort of with, and leading your family spiritually like that or does it come naturally to you? Look, there's probably two parts to that. It doesn't come naturally to me. The old Adam is strong. Yes. <laughs> and I've done kind of like a lot of leadership roles in the past and with camps and things like that. And so there's definitely always this part of me that really just, you know, I mean, doesn't everyone want to be in charge? I want to be in charge. I need to know how things are going. And obviously I know the best way that they should go. Definitely. Who could know better than me? <laughs> of course. So in that respect, it's difficult and it's, it's always difficult. I think it will always continue to be difficult to some degree, but also it's such a gift to understand that that's not a problem with the way that God has set out families for us. He set that up perfectly. We mess it up. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, something that has has helped me a little bit was I started covering my head a little while ago, mm -hmm. and that's just a physical reminder, which is so helpful. Mm -hmm. And that's, sorry, I'm mostly covering my head for church. And so when we're, you know, trying to get ready for church with three kids and things are crazy, um, and I'm starting to get sniffy because, you know, why can't we just, well, just let me organize this? I can get them all ready in the right order. Oh, no, hang on, hang on. I am not the only one who can do this. God has given Hayden as a leader and that's a good thing mm. I can relax I can trust him not because he's perfect but because God has ordained this and yes. because God is his head as well so God protects both of us yeah so that's just been uh, a thing that's been helpful yeah so like so many of the good things God gives us, he also gives us something physical. So in communion, we don't just have to, I mean, we do trust that God forgives us, but we also have the physical means of grace. So I have the bread in my mouth. There is no doubt about that. Yeah. There's not, oh, maybe I had communion today and maybe I didn't. No, no, no. I have had bread and wine today. Mm. God has attached his gift to a physical thing. There is no doubt about mm. it for me. Yeah. Yes. And so then also when I I can put on my head covering, I can remember, okay, this is a good gift 
God doesn't give us things that are harmful for us. They might be hard and uncomfortable, but when they are, it's usually because my pride is taking some sort of a hit and I'm noticing some sin about myself that I want to be in control. And often that's not just of my family, but of of everything. Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of trying to dethrone God and say, no, no, I've got this God. Thank you very much. I'll take it from here. Mm. Yeah, so that's been that's been a helpful thing. Also, just the fact that my parents modelled that really well. My mum is also a very capable, very organised person, and she made it very clear that if there were troubles, if there were differences of opinion between her and dad, dad had the final say because. In the Bible, Christ is the head of man, man is the head of the woman, and this isn't a bad thing. This is a good thing. Mm. And I had that good example from my mum, but also from my dad, who was in no way overbearing. He did not misuse that. He is a very gentle and a very humble person, and it was very obvious that any decisions he made were very well considered for the good of the family. That's very interesting that you wear it sort of as a reminder Sorry, the head covering as a reminder to yourself. Yeah, haven't thought of it like that before. My cross necklace, the reason I wear Mm. it is to remind myself that I represent Christ to people. And um, Mm. often when I'm out somewhere, I'll remember that I'm wearing it because I find myself playing with it and stuff. And then I go, oh, yes. And people do notice it. Nowadays, it's actually quite uncommon for non-Christians to wear a cross necklace um, Mm. that I've noticed anyway. And people do notice it. Lee's had a few conversations started just because of his necklace that he wears and yeah just having something physical to remind you who you are and whose you are and that I think Mm. is something that us humans do really benefit from. Yeah absolutely. So was it awkward when you decided to start covering your head? Was that? It was very gradual. I didn't decide I'm going to wear a head covering every Sunday. I'd thought about it for a long time. It was something that had been in the back of my mind for a long time, probably not for particularly spiritual reasons to start with, mostly just because I really enjoyed older fashions, especially sort of 40s, 50s, 60s, and sort of thought, oh, why can't we wear hats to church anymore? That's so cool. Yeah. And yeah, so it was more that to start with, I think, but then to see that in scripture and think, well, hang on, this is here. Mm. Why why don't I do this? And I, it, yeah, it really was quite a drawn out process. It wasn't a you know, thunderbolt overnight thing. I think I must have mentioned it to Hayden and he'd sort of said, oh, yeah, you know, that sounds like a good thing to do. I think I put it off for a little while because I, I think like a lot of people – It wasn't so much I was worried that people would look at me, but I didn't want to look like I was drawing attention to myself. Look how pious and holy she is. Yes. Um, So, yeah, in the end, I think Hayden had suggested, hey, we're going to this church in the city. It's not your home church. No one's probably even going to notice. Do you want to give it a go this week? And I thought, oh, yeah, that sounds good. And, of course, I think no one noticed. (laughs) It was not a big deal. Yeah. And so, yeah. And still from then, it was just kind of week by week, whether I thought about it for a while. And I kind of sort of just fell into wearing it every Sunday. Though I think a little bit instrumental in that was a few weeks where I'd find myself thinking, oh, I don't think a head covering is going to match this outfit very well. Like, I think I'll look nicer if I don't have one. And then I think, well, that seems like not really the spirit of things. Yes. Yeah. And so I think that kind of helped tip me over the edge, if you like, to think, yeah, no, this is a good thing. And I think I should keep doing this thing. It's not harming me at all. It's only benefiting, even if the benefits might be mildly uncomfortable at the time. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, It is part of the fall and it comes very naturally to us uh, women to want to take the lead and charge ahead and do what we think is best and, you know, kind of trod over our husbands a little bit. Mm. And so just, yeah, having something to remind us could be quite good. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there are a few women in the Lutheran church who do cover their heads some of them Mm. full-time some of them part-time some of them only in church Mm. and there are also beautiful women who do demonstrate you know submitting to their husbands and honoring and respecting their husbands and they don't 
cover their heads. And yeah, whether you cover or whether whether you don't, the foundation is God's beautiful order, his diversity. Mm. Is that yeah, he absolutely. created man for one purpose and he created woman for another purpose and they're complementary. They fit together so beautifully. And it's he did that because he is a diverse God. Mm. And that's mm. the foundation. You've actually said a few really beautiful things today that have made me think, oh, that's a really beautiful way of putting head coverings. Did you find that when your faith was deepened. Did that help you submit more easily? I know you said that, yeah, it's still hard sometimes. Hmm. Did you find that it helped you in any way? Yeah, absolutely. I suppose, I mean, when we're when we're reading the word and hearing the word, the Holy Spirit comes to us and he definitely helps with that. Yeah, I, I know we definitely find if we've got something difficult to discuss, that it always goes much better if we sit down and do a devotion first, if we yes. read the Bible first yeah. together. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's like so many things. There are times when I'm much better at it and then times where I just slowly forget bit by bit and things slip away a little bit and then I need another wake-up call to remember. Yeah, but then I suppose that's that's part of the benefit of every Sunday having that head covering and that's at least a little kick in the pants if I need it. <laughs> yes. And if we ask for God's help, then the Holy Spirit does remind us little by little we get better at it. And I was reading in 1 Peter 3 this morning, which is a beautiful passage, and I encourage our listeners to go and read it. And it talks about the relationship between husbands and wives, and it talks about what a modest character actually looks Mm. like on a woman. And some of the things that really stood out to me was that Peter is encouraging these wives to submit without fear. And I remember when I came to the conclusion that what the Bible said about male and female was true and that the man is the head of the home and the head of the wife. And I also came to the conclusion through reading scripture that leadership within the church was a call that God gave to men who filled the qualifications outlined Mm. in scripture. And I remember feeling a bit afraid and I remember thinking, oh Lord, this is what you have outlined for me in scripture and I can see the beauty in it and I can see your diversity in it. But submitting is a bit scary because there are abuses out there. There are abusive Mm. men there are men who exploit women in different ways. And Mm. I felt a little afraid. And just reading that verse, you know, we're not the only ones. I wasn't the only one who may have had those concerns that there were other Mm. women. And Peter talks directly to those women and he says, don't be afraid. And that's really encouraging. And that really helped me. So we are to be fearless women when it comes Mm. to submitting to our husbands and abusive marriages and things like that that's a whole nother topic and we're not saying that you must submit to abuse but um Mm. yeah just allowing my husband to do the job that he was called to do it has completely transformed our marriage Mm. and has really helped me appreciate not only how wonderful my husband is but to also appreciate the godly wonderful pastors that Mm. God has raised up in the church. Mm. Yeah. Yes, it can be really hard to, when you get to, I mean, there's so many passages in the Bible to disentangle them from all the, the, I don't know, baggage that goes along that we, that doesn't come from the Bible, it comes from the world. And it comes from the perversion of the good gifts that God has given us and not from the gifts themselves. So absolutely, there are so so many situations where perhaps the headship has been abused and it has been used as a weapon and it has been misused. But we have to remember that that is a misuse of it. It's not the problem with what God has ordained. It's the problem with people being sinful, messing Mm. these things up and using them for their own gain. So yeah, that can be a difficult thing to try and sort of come at it afresh and recognize that this is the truth. This is the origin of it. It wasn't that there was this going on and God sort of said, oh, I'll, I'll take this sort of thing that's happening in the world and shape it into something okay. Mm. God ordained this. This was first. Mm, yeah. The other stuff, that's the right. rubbish has come second from people, not from God. Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. I had sort of that epiphany recently that I've, yeah, for a while now been saying how God God's ways are always different to ours and God's ways often seem topsy-turvy and, you know, whatever we think, like as humans, God's way will be the opposite of that. And recently I was like, hang on a minute, no, God's way is the truth. God's way is the right way out. Everything we think and the way we do it is topsy-turvy and yeah. twisted <laughs> yeah. and messed up. His way, what he says, is the right way. It's the good way that he established right from the start and that is yeah the truth and Mm. we've somehow over the uh, millennia twisted it up and messed it up and tipped it on its head and Mm. um, now yeah now it feels hard to understand which way's up (laughs) and yeah yeah. so thank the lord we have the bible to help us know which way is up yeah Mm. yeah I'm looking forward to the day when we don't have to deal with our own sinful nature anymore. Mm -hmm. That will be gone and we can just enjoy God and his goodness in its fullness. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find that when you do um, submit and just let your husband lead that that really motivates them to do it well? Yeah. I can't think of any time where in hindsight I've regretted it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Are you able to actually give us and our listeners like an example of something that's happened where, if you're comfortable to, where you have submitted yeah, to sure. Hayden and it has ended up just being a great blessing? Yeah, sure. I think it's probably not so much one event as... I am very prone to just answer the kids no matter what without stopping, which is, you know, that's just kind of part of being at home Mm -hmm. because usually if they're talking to someone, they're probably talking to me. But we're really blessed to have Hayden home a lot at the moment just because of how his work is. And I have to stop myself and I'm still really working hard on this. They'll either say, hey, dad, and I answer without thinking and I'm really working on just stopping and letting him answer because he does know these things too. He yeah. can, and he might have better ideas than me. Who knew? <laughs> yes. And definitely even just regardless of the fact that he's my husband, no one wants to be talked over. <laughs> yes. But yeah. And then when you add in that fact that we are husband and wife, I'm not even giving him a chance to lead when I'm doing that. I'm I'm taking away the job that God has given him. And when I do manage to remember, and I'm hopefully getting better at it, and hear whatever he has to say to the kids, there is generally peace that goes, oh, yes, it is going to be okay. I don't have to do this all by myself. Yes. God has, he's instituted this for a good purpose. So Hayden can lead. He can, he can sort things out. He's got good ideas. I don't have to do everything. And it becomes less of why don't I get to do everything to I don't have to this is a good thing. This is a relief. Yeah. And doesn't that give you just more space, more oh, space yeah. <laughs> and more rest and you can just be mm. the beautiful woman that God has created you to be. It's so much easier to be a godly woman when you're married to a godly man. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes, definitely a huge That's blessing true. there. Mm. Yeah. One of the areas that I've really learned to submit to Tasman recently is also in what God has called your husband to do. So Mm. for example, Taz is now traveling a lot over to the mainland for study and for church events and different things like that. And most of the time I'm at home with the girls for however long he's gone. I used to get so bitter and just frustrated because he's over there talking about theology and doing all these different things and I'm home cleaning the kitchen and putting the kids to bed on my own. And it is exhausting. It is hard work. And just realizing that God has called my husband to do this and I need to submit to my husband being called to study to be a pastor Mm -hmm. and to learn how to do ministry. And it made me realize that, you know, he needs me if he is to become a pastor and fulfill this ministry and just, yeah, just realizing that my calling is wrapped up in his. And so being home with my children, loving my children, looking after them while daddy is over on the mainland learning about the ministry it's such a privilege to be able to do that with him. Mm-hmm. And so instead of resisting my husband's calling, 
I'm submitting to to him and how God has called him to do this beautiful thing. And I have a very important part to play in it. Mm. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so much easier to enjoy being home than once. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Once you've realized that and sort of understood that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a huge blessing to Taz then to have a wife who is so supportive and who uh, isn't at home just stewing, but who is, yeah, supporting him to do what he feels God is calling him to. Yeah. So it blesses you and it blesses him. Yeah. And one of the qualifications of a pastor is that his children are to be under control. Yeah. And, mm, yeah. And, <laughs> no biggie. <laughs> and that's, that, that rests on my shoulders very much too. Mm. <laughs> He needs me to help train up these children, to help raise these children. So, <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely something that I've struggled with um, more because, yeah, Lee is very hands-on and the discipline and very strict and I am not that <laughs> naturally. <laughs> and, yeah, part of submitting to my husband has been being more strict. It's what is really important to him and so that's been a big learning curve for me. And the result is is kids that are pretty well behaved <laughs> yeah <laughs> but me just submitting to that has made a big difference yeah yeah um Lizzie if you could say something to our listeners about this topic mm. what would you want to say to them yeah so I suppose my encouragement would be to especially to lifelong Lutherans who have grown up in the church and have just always been there to not neglect the good gifts that we have in the catechism and in the book of concord it looks really intimidating but it's not it's great and it's much more reader friendly than it perhaps seems for being such an enormous book the the version i've got the book of concord readers edition breaks it up into sections and gives you a yearly reading plan and of course i am already way out of that but it gives me a good idea of this is a good amount to read this day yeah yeah, so that's been great. And definitely use the resources we have around us, not to just, of course, we're so blessed to have this wonderful theology, not to let it slip by because it's there and it's so wonderful. And there are so many resources. There are podcasts, there are books, there, are, of course, we talked about Jonathan Fisk's Broken. That's an excellent, excellent place to start. There's This podcast is wonderful. I found Table Talk Radio to be really really helpful and gentle and probably matched my sense of humor pretty well <laughs> lots of dad jokes <laughs> and to to look at the hymns that we're singing and maybe go back again after church and read them they're so full and they're so rich and I think also another thing would be to not be scared to find out why we don't believe the things that we don't believe I think that's really important and that's perhaps one place that the teaching in our church has been quite lacking for a while, which is understandable because we don't want to sound just needlessly critical of other people. But knowing why we don't believe what we don't believe is really helpful to know why we do believe what we do believe. Yes. And so then when you come up against different ideas, you're prepared for them. You can say, oh, okay, yes, this might sound good, but because of this, it doesn't track. And then we've got this instead. And that gives us great assurance. And so many times, I think Lutheran theology is just so full of assurance. There's no wondering. Mm, yeah. There's, we are forgiven. You physically have bread and wine. There is no question about whether that went into your mouth today you know you're forgiven or you don't have to worry about whether you feel God at a particular time or with particular music or in a particular place in nature. He's there. Mm. He loves you and you don't have to wonder about that. And I think perhaps that is the greatest, greatest gift that I have received through digging further into theology is just the assurance. There is there is no question. Yeah. Whenever, well, I suppose whenever there are questions, there's an answer. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing depends on us and everything depends on what Jesus has done for us. And I suppose the law and the gospel is what Lutherans are perhaps known for. And even though we probably hear it to understand how they work really helps you to just understand everything, I think. It can really help how you read the Bible and how you hear sermons and just clears up 
a lot of things. Yes. So definitely don't neglect the theology books or podcasts or just Bible studies and chatting to other people. We've got such a wealth of riches there that uh, they're good gifts. They might feel like, oh my goodness, another thing I have to read, another thing I have to fit in my day, but they are good gifts from God and he doesn't pile burdens on us for no reason. Mm, yes. <laughs> yes. That was so articulate and beautiful. So thank you, Lizzie, for joining us today and talking about all these wonderful things. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Here She Stands podcast. Many of the topics discussed today, such as head coverings and headship within marriage, can be found in 1 Corinthians 11. If you have any questions about this passage, such as, should I cover my hair when I go to church? What does it mean when the Bible says that the husband is the head of the wife? Does God really want me to submit to my husband? Does this mean that I lose all autonomy? We encourage you to go and ask your pastor, as well as search the scriptures to see what it says for itself. We would also like to offer you the opportunity to send in your questions and have them answered in an upcoming Q&A. This Q&A will be released on May 7th, and our guest will be Dr. Greg Lockwood from South Australia. Dr. Lockwood was Associate Professor at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He also served as professor at the Australian Lutheran College in Adelaide as a parish pastor and a missionary in Papua New Guinea. His commentary on 1 Corinthians has been published by Concordia Publishing House. So please send your questions to hereshestands.podcast at gmail.com by Tuesday the 16th of April. Here She Stands is an Australian podcast for Lutheran women and we release new episodes every two weeks on a Tuesday. You can find us on all major podcasting platforms as well as YouTube. You can also follow on Facebook and Instagram. If you would like to contact us directly, our email address is hereshestands.podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, we pray that you will hold fast to God's word and confidently say, Here I stand, I can do no other.